how much more, how, about how many more molecules of water do you think are in that pot than the air in the oven? Like 10 times more, 100 times more, 1,000 times more? 10 times more? So maybe 100 or 1,000. The density of air is about a 1,000th that of water. But the volume of the water in the pot is not the same as the volume of the water in the oven. Like you would, you could put about 10 times more, 10 to 100 times more pots volume into the oven, but the water is about a thousand times more dense. So, you know, I'd say there's on the order of a hundred times more water in the pot in terms of the number of molecules than the number of molecules in the oven. So when you compare, this is like, boiling water and then you have air in the oven this is it well it's 212 Fahrenheit which is also 100 degrees Celsius and then the air in the oven is this is hot air as long as you don't touch the rack you know like you can reach in and grab something like you might have pizza and you can like slide it out you know what I mean just grab the crust give it a little tug the crust has a low specific heat the cheese does not. We don't touch. You know what I mean? Like, cheese will burn you. It has a higher water content. The hot air at 400 degrees or 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, I'll just write 212 degrees Fahrenheit. 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So the the water has a higher mass. Maybe like 100 times the mass of the air in the oven, and also has a higher specific heat. You know, what you always got to think about in physics is fundamentally this world is made of stuff and that stuff can move around. So they're individual particles that collide with your skin. And the more of them that collide and the faster they're moving, the more energy they impart to your skin. So when we talk about heat and talk about temperature, you're ultimately just talking about individual particles in motion. And it's really no different than the idea of, you know, a cart going down the table, you can talk about how much mass it has and how fast it's going and get an amount of energy. It's really not that much different than fluids. And in a lot of ways, when people talk about the flow of heat, they talk about it almost as if it's like a fluid, although heat's not a fluid. So when you stick your hand into this, there are particles that collide with your skin and that collision imparts energy to your skin. You can get, you can get tore up by boiling water or even worse by steam. You know, you have a thing and you take the lid off and the steam hits mess you up which is what also much makes uh cooking efficient in water because if you think about relative cooking times for boiling and for uh air in the oven like you make some you make some craft macaroni and cheese you dump that macaroni in here uh well it has to absorb some water but it it cooks relatively fast if you compare that to cooking times in ovens oven cooking times usually longer than cooking times in water except you wouldn't like you don't boil cake, right? And if you put raw pasta in the oven, it just makes it harder and darker. So there are obviously different cooking techniques. A lot of the, a lot of the ideas in physics courses have to do with making distinctions between ideas. This one is at a higher temperature. But you could say this one can deliver more heat. As a form of energy. Heat and heat and temperature don't mean the same thing. They are not synonyms anymore. You can say that when the temperature is high, you can say the thing is hot. That's like, okay. But how much heat is moved depends upon temperature, but it also depends upon like it depends upon other factors. So keep those two ideas in your mind separate. When you measure temperature, you can do it a bunch of different ways, but all the time, this idea of thermometry, thermometry is the study of uh, measuring temperature. You're gonna measure some kind of physical change that occurs in a system for thermometers, like alcohol thermometers or mercury thermometers. There is a liquid, there's a liquid in here, which uh, continues down the column same thing here with mercury 
it continues down the column. Whenever you put this thermometer in something that's hot, the little thing goes up. Like why fundamentally does that column move? Like how does that liquid know to like go to a different place to indicate a different temperature? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it turns out there can be an increase in pressure. The above the column from like here to here, it's actually evacuated its vacuum. So the pressure in here is essentially zero all the time, except it turns out for alcohol thermometers, the alcohol does have a vapor pressure and it evaporates a little bit. So there really isn't there really isn't a pressure inside the inside the thermometer because it also turns out, especially for mercury thermometers, if you have a gas and then as the column moves, it will pressurize the gas and that can cause not only the thermometer to break, but it puts back pressure on the fluid, which can also get gas to dissolve in the fluid. So that kind of creates a problem. You got a liquid and you heat it up. It, it does expand, but why does it expand? The molecules move more quickly. Yeah, and as they move more quickly, they bounce off each other and there's a greater distance between them. So it's like a simple model of a physical model of a, of a particles that are bouncing up against each other. At a low speed, they don't go very far. At higher speeds, they bounce further. And as a result, the volume increases. So it's true that for liquids and for, well, liquid solids and gases, whenever you increase the temperature, the volume will increase and the density will go down. So what you're actually, you're not actually measuring the temperature. You're not measuring the temperature directly. Instead, you're looking at a physical change in the density of a, of a substance as a result of higher motion, higher rates of collision. Another way to measure temperature includes like using a thermistor. So most all thermometers that you interact with or digital thermometers, it could be like, you know, the one for your car and it might tell you the temperature on the dashboard or an electronic thermometer. And the principle there is, and we didn't study this because we should have, but we will. It would have been at the end of physics one. Uh, all metals have a resistance, a resistance to the flow of electricity. And that resistance is dependent upon temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the resistance. So whenever you send electrons through a wire, if the wire is warm, there's a greater resistance to the flow of electricity. When the water's cold, there's a lower resistance to the flow of electricity. So the principle behind electronic thermometers is you send a very small electric current through a wire down through this probe, and it has to go back up to where it came from. And when this is placed in something that's cold, it has a lower resistance. And so a meter can measure the resistance of the metal. So you're actually measuring a change in electrical resistance in a metal as a result of a change in temperature. I'll demonstrate uh, thermal couples, but they're good for measuring very high temperatures. And now everybody's familiar with infrared thermometers because they're the thing that they point at your head. There we go. So this is like one that I've had, not forever, but for a long time. I can point it at the wall. It says 72 degrees Fahrenheit. If I point it at my hand, it'll say like 89 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there's a real big issue with these that people don't have them calibrated correctly for use on the forehead. Because you know, like when you take your temperature, you got to like stick something in you somewhere for your core temperature. Like if I point this at my head, it'll say 96, which is kind of like, you know, on the low end, 91. And I've got like hypothermia, you know. Um, so when people use these as forehead scanners and they're not calibrated for surface use to derive what the temperature of the inside of your body is. Uh, basically, if you just point this at anyone's forehead, even if they have a horrible fever, and that's at 686, that's not right, 91. They can have an incredibly high fever, point this at their forehead, and they'll still say like 97, 98, because it's the temperature of the surface of their skin. They sell ones that are calibrated, which adjust the temperature just simply by adding a couple degrees to like what the surface temperature of the forehead of your skin. But anyway, here I point it and it says like 72, 73, and that's all good. 
but the back of this monitor now says like 84 Fahrenheit. Uh, that ventilation unit's not probably blowing hot air or cold air right now. But you can point it at like the vent. Oh, it is cool air, 66 Fahrenheit. And what this is measuring is the amount of infrared radiation that something gives off. Everything has a temperature. And the higher the temperature, the higher the frequency of radiation that's, that's emitted is infrared radiation. Uh, you can point it toward the sun, and it'll tell you the temperature of the sun. In fact, in astronomy, the way that we know temperatures is by measuring the frequency of infrared radiation that's emitted. So all the time with thermometer, thermometry, you're not measuring temperature directly, but you're measuring something that uh, results in a physical change in the thermometer itself, like a change in density or a change in resistance or you're measuring the amount of infrared radiation that's emitted. A thermometer is a speedometer for atoms. So if you want to know how fast atoms are going, you stick a thermometer in and it tells you about speed. And you know about Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin scales of temperature. Here in America, we like to use Fahrenheit and there's a few other countries that do too. There are, there are metric countries that use Fahrenheit. So it turns out Fahrenheit temperatures are more common than you might think, but still it's like, I think it's on the order of like a dozen countries. That's it. It's not a whole bunch of countries. The biggest thing to pay attention to is uh, this freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. In the Fahrenheit scale, you know the freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and the boiling point is 212. There's 180 degrees between boiling and freezing. In the Celsius and Kelvin scales, there's 100, so from 0 to 100, or 273.15 to 373.15. Because temperature is a measurement of speed, in a way, but really kinetic energy, kinetic energy can never be negative, so it's actually meaningless to ever have a negative temperature. That doesn't have a real meaning in reality, so although we might have a really cold day here in Williamsport and say the temperature is negative 5 Fahrenheit, it doesn't really mean that the temperature is less than zero, because that would mean that the motion has stopped and somehow the particles are moving at a speed that's slower than zero, which doesn't make any sense at all. So the thing to know is anytime you see the degree symbol, like here or here, that degree symbol tells you that zero is set at some other arbitrary value that is non-zero. So when we say it's zero degrees Fahrenheit, the degree symbol straight up says uh, zero doesn't mean zero. Zero means some other number. An analogy to that is, uh, well, I don't know if you know this, but until like 1994 or so, there was a national speed limit in our country, 55 miles an hour. There wasn't a single road you'd go fa faster than 55. That was it. Um, it was a law that was implemented in the 70s because of fuel shortages and stuff. So let's say, but let's say that every road in this country, the speed limit is 55. Every road. Well, you could have a speedometer that says zero, and then, you know, 55 is up here. And whenever you're traveling 55 miles an hour, the needle would say like 55. But you could also make a speedometer that would say zero and then have a negative 55. So that when you're traveling 55, the speedometer says zero. And you might say, well, that's stupid. Why would you ever do that? And it's because if you have a positive speed, it means you're going faster than the speed limit. And if you have a negative speed, it means you're going slower than the speed limit. So that if you're traveling at a speed that's like 10, then it's 10 more than you're supposed to be going, 10 over 55. Does that make sense? So that's really a way to think about what zeros mean on both the Fahrenheit and the Celsius scale. We picked a convenient place by which to measure things in the world we live in. Because to be honest, zero on the absolute scale is so ridiculously cold that there is never a situation in nearly everyone's life, except for people who work in low temperature physics. And I used to work in a low temperature physics lab at Penn State where we used to be able to get things down to temperatures in the order of a millikelvin. That's like 0 0.001 Kelvin, very close to absolute zero temperatures. But that's just a few nerds, like nobody else does that. These temperatures down here are very, very low. So it's better on a practical sense for our life to measure temperatures where zero is at some other place.
but the zero on the Fahrenheit scale and the zero on the Celsius scale are not at the same place. The standards for Celsius, zero is the freezing point, 100 is the boiling point of water. And I've told you this about fluids a lot. And last year, we used water as a standard for so many things in the metric system. And it's like, well, why not use water to set your temperature scale? There's conversions up there to get you between Celsius and Kelvin. So you see that from the Celsius scale to the Kelvin scale, you add 273.15. So 273.15 added to 100 is 373.15. But the issue with the Fahrenheit scale and the Celsius scale is not only are the zero points not at the same place, but the size of a Celsius and the size of a degree Fahrenheit are not the same. It takes 180 to get from here to here, but it only takes oops, 180 to get from freezing to boiling, but it only takes 100 to get from uh, freezing to boiling in Celsius. So because the size of a degree Fahrenheit is 1.8 times bigger than the size of a degree Celsius, that's what the 9 fifths fraction is in here. You also see references where it says 1.8, 9 fifths is 1.8. And then the plus 32 is to get you the offset so that the zeros at a uh, different place. There's a very famous, uh, there was an episode of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You know who wants to be a millionaire? And there was a question, I think it was like a quarter million or the half million dollar question. It was like way up there. And the question was, negative 40 Fahrenheit is what temperature in Celsius? And the guy was like, oh, he's like, I forget how the conversion works. He's like, I, I know there's like a 32 in there. And you can hear him like walking through it. Like he knew like what to do. And uh, he bailed. He's like, I'm walking away. I'm taking the money. Negative 40. So if you go nine fifths of negative 40 degrees Celsius plus 32, nine fifths of negative 40 is negative 72 plus 32. is negative 40. They asked him the only temperature that you didn't have to do the conversion for, negative 40 Celsius and negative 40 Fahrenheit, they're the same. It's the place where the scales cross over. So then when they put the answer up, they're like, you sure you're walking away? He's like, final answer, I'm walking away. And they're like, what's the right answer? And they highlighted negative 40. And he was like, oh, oh, oh. You know, like, um, I mean, who would guess negative 40 except for somebody who thinks that there's no difference? Or someone who thinks maybe it's a trick question. Or if you ever get it, now you know. It's the only two temperatures at which the scales uh, correspond. It's almost as good as the llama thrust guy. Do you know the llama thrust guy? This seems like it's fake. Oh look, that's funny, because that's actually the Snopes page. Um, on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Here it goes. He used a uh, the audience lifeline, equal, which is hilarious, equal to roughly 746 watts, which animal base unit is used to measure the rate at which work is done? Horsepower, llama thrust, donkey strength, or zebra force? And he didn't know, which is hilarious, that horsepower is a unit of power, and llama thrust would be like absurd, you know? So people call it the llama thrust meme because and people argue about that because they're like, but I like zebra strength or zebra force, donkey strength. In some ways, when you think about it, horsepower is just as crazy as a unit as llama thrust. <laughs>